All right, well, let's get started because uh, it's after 12 o'clock. So um, welcome to Impact Cat Chat for uh, July 24th. Time's flying quickly. Um, glad to be here, glad to have so many people here. We have a few uh, special guests that, that we'll introduce in a, in a second, but I just wanna go over some broad, um, broad strokes first in explaining what this is. So just first off the bat, just so you know, we record each of these Impact Cat Chats and so you can always access the recording later. I share them through the Linfield Ahead if you're a student or community member here, uh, but I can also share them with everybody who attends today so that you can, you're welcome to share the recording with anyone else that you want. Um, so that is always available. This space is an ongoing dialogue space. So it's an, it's open to everybody in our community. And today we're, we're going even beyond our typical community, which is fantastic. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to share from our perspectives, from our lived experiences, to hear, mostly to hear from other people and hear about their lived experiences and to really gain a deeper understanding of our collective community. So, um, all questions, all, um, all experiences are welcome to be shared here. Uh, this is a, an open space for everyone. So we'll be respectful when other, other people are speaking and, and let everybody share as much uh, or as little as they want. We also have the chat box too. Uh, you can add, people tend to add to the chat box there, but then you can also, if you wanted to add a, an anonymous question, you can send it to just me and I will go ahead and uh, share that with uh, Lindsay and Natalie who are going to help uh, moderate today. So that is, that's what we're doing. Uh, I want to give a special shout out and welcome to Shannon Stoller and the interns at uh, McMinnville Works. Thanks for being here today. We appreciate your presence. Um, I will also just introduce myself before handing it off uh, to, to the others in the, what we call the Fab Five, which is the Impact Cat Chat uh, planning team. I'm Jane Samuels. I'm the Associate Athletic Director here at Linfield University. I'm also the Senior Woman Administrator and a part of my uh, area is um, equity and also uh, student development. So this is where uh, for me professionally I come into the conversation. Personally I come into the conversation just wanting to always learn and understand my community better and understand how I can be an ally to everyone in my community and so that's that's my ongoing uh, life learning. So I'll pass it on to kids or Natalie, who wants to go next? I'll go ahead and go. Uh, hi, I'm Coach Kibbs. I coach the women's lacrosse team at Linfield University. I'm from Kentucky originally. I'm going into my third year at Linfield. Um, and I think I also just want to extend that we really started this cat chat also as a way to provide a space for people to get on and discuss. If you want to, totally optional. Um, it's a learning environment for everyone, including all of us like on the panel. Um, and it's just a way it was initially thought of because of COVID as a way for people to just like engage and learn rather than having to be kind of somewhat limited to social media and our bipartisan news outlets. So um, this is just a great space to ask questions and learn. So thank you for being here. Yeah, I definitely. I agree with that 100%. I've told people that this has been very therapeutic. Um, I'm, I'm Natalie Welch. I'm an assistant professor in the uh, School of Business. I uh, focus on sport management, also the faculty athletic representative, and um, originally from the Cherokee Reservation in North Carolina, um, and really proud of, you know, kind of my native heritage, and uh, love promoting um, just different all kind of native athletes, native uh, scholars and all that, all that good stuff. And um, when George Floyd was murdered, um, Lindsay had reached out to me and we'd started talking with Jane and John and uh, Coach Hire. And um, it just was a very, it was a good way for us to, you know, you're, you're going through the news cycle and you're seeing these headlines and you're like getting really emotional. And so this was a great way for us to like kind of, channel that energy into a good positive thing and it's been um i know super rewarding for me and i think um the conversations we've had have been super engaged and um rewarding for everyone hopefully and so um with that i will pass along to john coach willis how's everybody doing i'm coach john willis uh by way of men's basketball like 904 also <laughs> 
Florida guy, yes. So um, that's my connection to the group. And uh, I'm glad to be here. Looking forward to another great uh, discussion and conversation with everyone today. I guess uh, that leaves me. Uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Doug Heyer, um, Senior Associate <coughs> Athletic Director at Linfield. Uh, I just stepped down as, uh, as the assistant head coach at Linfield for the past 20 years. Uh, my role is more with facilities and game management. I'm also the NCA uh, designee for inclusion. Uh, this platform has been wonderful, like all of my peers have shared. And um, <clears throat> I'm originally from Hawaii. I played uh, high school ball at Pro City Hawaii. I'm also a Linfield graduate. Um, I am of Polynesian descent, specifically my mom is from Samoa. Uh, my son uh, had me do a DNA test and found out that I also have Tongan blood as well. If you didn't know that, how could I? I got Tongan too. So anyway, um, uh, great to have you all here. And I, I want to in introduce three guys that uh, I had asked to join us. Um, three special people to me and they uh, all three were teammates, uh, football players here at Linfield. And, and I asked them to join us because I, I want to hear their story. In Hawaii, we talk about talking story, telling your story. And this is a platform for people to be able to share and tell their story. Because I think it's important, pe important for people to hear other people's stories and appreciate what the experiences, the things that we have gone through. And so I asked uh, Kalai Parrish, who was a uh, safety for us here from Kapolei, Hawaii, and I, I know he's living a busy life right now with, uh, I believe, still working Hawaiian Air and working his family farm on the big island of Hawaii, and um, he's also playing music, and he's pretty dang talented as well. And then Nate Dixon, uh, I just saw a couple weeks, good friends of ours, and well, we like to share uh, tequila at times and have fun, and, but Nate was also a very three-star athlete at Kapolei, Hawaii, um, and now is currently working at uh, uh, Nike up in Portland. And then last but not least is my son, Aaron. And I, I, I think that I've learned a lot from him, especially um, in the things that have been going on um, in, in today's, uh, in, in, you know, the things that are going on today. And so I refer to Aaron quite a bit. And so Aaron was, uh, uh, you know, philosophy major and other majors and, but, uh, he actually wrote his thesis on being of mixed race. And so we asked him to, I wanted him to be part of this and share, these three guys can share their experiences and tell their story and what they've experienced here at Linfield. Because it's real, things that's going on is real. And it's, hap it's happened here at Linfield and it's happened here at McMinnville. And so I welcome the three boys, three guys with us. So. Welcome, welcome, we're happy you're here. Yes, thank you for joining us. All right, Jane, do you want to, uh, I think you already kind of recognized the McMinnville, uh, it's the McMin McMin McMinnville Works, right? McMinnville Works interns. If any of you guys want to say hi, maybe just introduce yourself. Tell us where you're working. I'll go. Hi, my name is Shannon Stoller. I'll be a senior at Linfield University currently studying sport management. And I'm here on behalf of the McMinnville Works Internship Program as their coordinator. Jamea, did you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi guys, my name is Jamea Stewart. I'm an incoming sophomore at Oregon State University and my internship, I'm the HR intern for the city of McMinnville. Great. Welcome, welcome. We're happy you've joined yeah. us. Awesome. If anybody else wants to share, feel free, but if not, we can dive in, Jane. I'll, I'll just jump in there. Um, yeah. I'm, Mr. Blank. I'm with McMinnville Economic Development, and we really appreciate this opportunity for you to allow our interns to join in. I, it looks like we might be missing a few, but thank you, Jamea and Shannon, for pulling in the crew. Um, we have about, uh, Shannon was at 14 interns this year uh, working throughout McMinnville area, and uh, we really appreciate this opportunity. Awesome. No, thank you guys for joining us. Jane, did we lose you? <laughs> 
I think Jane disappeared for a second. Uh, this is Mike Blackmore. I'm the head cross yeah. coach. And uh, I'm looking forward to the season starting here in a couple weeks uh, with our uh, 24 incoming uh, um, cross country athletes. Yeah, and you guys will have the spotlight. Pretty excited about that. Yeah, well, well hopefully um, um, the other schools in our conference uh, um, want to race under safe conditions, and we're working on those protocols right now, and, and uh, things are looking pretty good. Yeah. So if anybody missed it this week, the Northwest Conference, I decided that football, volleyball, soccer, men and women's soccer, and – Oh, I'm missing one. They are going to be uh, postponed to the spring. And then we're going to try to do cross country, golf, and tennis. So um, in the fall. So depending on what the other conference schools want to do. So um, I think it's uh, honestly, it's uh, better. You know, it could have been way worse. So I think we're going to try to make the best thing, lemon, lemonade out of some lemons and um, just you know, give students the opportunity to still train and work and get better and, um, you know, hopefully have some competition in the, in the spring. And I know many of you, I can, I can guess Molly, I would, I would wonder what she would think about this. I was just thinking about how much the percentage of your kind of experience as an athlete is the competitions. Cause I think a lot of it is the more of the, the culture and the bonding and practices and, you know, the other pieces of, uh, of being an athlete so still I think we can as, like a team and practicing and stuff yeah I think we can still provide that and get those competitions in hopefully in the spring so yeah well thanks yeah. everybody again for joining us Shannon, yeah. did you them oh as in say I'm so as a student athlete I'm excited to see how it's gonna unite us in a non-traditional way um I think that's gonna be like the upside of it all is we're going to be able to bond not just like obviously on the court but we're going to find other ways to bond off the court um so I'm excited at least that's like what we discussed for the volleyball team but I'm sure yeah. it, it's a really good conversation to have with like all athletes so and I think it's important to remember some people get stressed out about like like everyone's got FOMO right now like they're missing out but it's like everyone is missing out so you know, are you really, you're not actually missing out. It's just not happening, but it's the same way for everyone. So there's nothing to really be stressed out about. It's just, we're just going to adapt and make it work. Absolutely. Uh, uh, you want me to share my screen for the uh, PowerPoint just so we have, since sure. Jane kind of disappeared. <laughs> we got her back. Oh, okay. But go ahead, Lindsay, you're good. Okay. And also a little background too on, uh, so last week we kind of changed things up a little bit. Um, early on we were kind of just like a kind of tackling kind of current events and um, kind of working through the basics of like, information sharing and kind of just having conversations around that, but we wanted to make it more intentionally um, reflective. And so um, we wanted to kind of, we've all been doing different workshops around race and we wanted to um, think about how we could facilitate that better. And so we wanted to make sure we gave time for people to um, write things down or, you know, just have more time with it. And so that's what we're going to do again this week. We're going to have some questions and we're going to have some reflection time and then hopefully come back and people can share what they've written or um, we can kind of play off of each other in our stories. So I'm, I'm think we're good. You guys are ready. Yeah. And some of these are just, I'll chime in because I did not, um, I added uh, to our slides towards the end of the, um, the presentation. So these slides that we have up now are ones that we, we used last week, but they were great uh, conversation starters. So if we, if we decide we want to stick with these, uh, we can look at these again together, or we can skip ahead to like slide three, and that would be new stuff. But whatever you, sounds good to you guys. I don't know how many and people are repeats from last week. Yeah. Did we want to show the video, or what do we think? Sure. 
Oh you yeah. I don't have the, I don't think I have it. I'll pull that up. If you stop uh, sharing, then I'll just, I, I got it queued up. So this video will kind of play off the idea of uh, race as a social construct and how we understand uh, racism. So uh, definitely think this is a great, provide some value. And the source is from, I don't know how many of you guys are doing this, but uh, the Ally to Action organization has a 21 day challenge. And so this is, that's where we, we got this video from. Jane, can you unmute so we can hear the video? Rich Trontor. My name is Mike Mellon, and I have light perception, so I can tell like, the lights are on or the studio lights are on, but I can't like see anything else. I can't see anything, no lights, no color, anything. Totally dark. I, no. No. I would like to think that I'm not. However, there are the stereotypes that have been instilled in everyone. I am racist because I think every white person is racist. I participate in institutions like I benefit from capitalism, which was built on slavery and racism. I've experienced uh, racism, but don't let it bother me. I think allowing it to affect me um, gives them the, the upper hand. No. I can't see. <laughs> Blindness does sometimes take those racial cues out of society because if I can't tell by someone's voice or accent or whatever, like I have no idea. I've noticed with a lot of people I meet, I don't really find out what their race is until a while after we meet. You know, we don't necessarily go around asking the whole, are you black, are you white, you know, um, you are who you are as far as I'm concerned. I work with a person who's Japanese, but I would have no idea unless she told me. Like, there's just no, like, cue that I have. I can tell, more or less, if the person's Caucasian, Black, Mexican, you know, what, whatever it might be, by their voice, accent. Like, seeing someone's skin color, I think, is not the only way that we differentiate people's, like, culture or race. I can pick up dialects and sometimes try to associate them with what race they might be. I wish I could just completely just ignore it, but I can't help it. If I'm walking down the street and I hear a couple of people and they're like aggressively talking to each other and it's slang and vulgar speech and it's not eloquent, I naturally sometimes think, oh, those people might be black because of their, their accent. I shouldn't think like that, but there are natural stereotypes out there in the world. hear the way someone speaks and make a, a determination about them that could be completely inaccurate because you just don't know. I've had experiences where I've known, you know, a person for probably a year, year and a half or so, and um, they never knew I was black. Ironically, this was another another black person. They were like, you're, bl you're black? And I was, yeah, you're not black. So. <laughs> I believe like there's racism within the blind community because there's racism everywhere, and the blind community is no exception. I think it's, a, it's their upbringing, how they were raised. I grew up in North Idaho, and I wasn't exposed to a lot of people from different cultures. And I grew up in the home of my, my dad, who was pretty racist is the term I want to use, but pretty vocal about identifying people by their race. Like, this is how he grew up. I'm from, from India, and my dad <coughs> is a different complexion, and they got married to each other. And they are like pretty, you know, happy couple. It's a good example for us, you know. If I did, I probably didn't recognize it because I don't look for it. The issues I've seen the blind community kind of take on, um, maybe they tend to be more like white issues. One thing I haven't seen the blind community collectively work on is housing justice. And I'm complicit in this too, right? Because I'm a blind person, right? So I could be the person to organize and I'm not. People who are blind come in all shapes sizes, economic backgrounds, beliefs, and some of them are racist. That's something that we, as a society in general, blindness excluded, need to work on being better at.
Thanks, Jane. Yeah. So I definitely found that to be pretty fascinating. Um, thinking about when we take away our 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 sight and uh, kind of the stereotypical or the face value things that we kind of take for granted as far as uh, when it comes to race. But um, Lindsay, what you think? What what question you want to pose? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that I took away from that too was just that um, any kind, like as one of the people said, um, if I had experienced any racism or um, knew about it, it was because my dad or like somebody was talking about it or told me about it. Otherwise, without seeing, they really didn't, or they tried not to have, you know, any kind of perspective on that. So you know, race as a social construct, I think that that's kind of clearly identifies that, that, that it's what you're taught and who you learn from. Um, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, Aaron, go for it. Um, I think a good grounding point is uh, defining terms as we move forward. So first off, like, let's, let's agree on what racism is. Now, the old definition of racism is the one that people are most comfortable with, right? You know, so what is racism usually in modern day language? It's, you know, prejudice, bias, hate, but those are actually byproducts of racism. The, the newer definition is a system of oppression or a system of power um, based on race. And the byproducts of that system are the things you see in day-to-day -day life, right? So um, the second thing we should probably define is the social construct of race, because that's actually something that hasn't been agreed on by experts, because there's a biological component to race as well. So um, if you look at books like Before the Dawn by Nicholas Wade, um, it gives evidence as to certain populations that have biological differences, because the original definition of race wasn't based on any biological determinism, it was based on geographical location, for example. So if you look at the last 10 sprinting championships in the Olympics, they've been won by people of West African descent, dominating in all, in all the top podium spots. So um, is that a race? Um, if you look at the Samoan population, uh, time, 16 minutes did a, a study on the Samoan population in the NFL, and if you're born to Samoan parents, you're 55% more likely to make it in the NFL. Now, is, is that a racial difference um, or is that a social construct? And it's tricky, you know, there's some cultural components that make Hawaiians and Samoans better in the NFL, but there's also some biological differences and you can't ignore those either. So just context for moving forward. That's really great, Aaron. I, we really appreciate that. And that's something we definitely wanna do is have those kind of a grounding and what what do we what do we mean when we say these things so we appreciate that yeah because language right now is more has been kind of a discussion of like really having to critically think about everything that you're actually saying and not just because and i think we we talk about this often too like in social media and stuff with the quick posts and the the um not having patience to like actually like look through things or do your homework that people just kind of off the cuff say different things that they actually don't even haven't even taken the second to think about what they're saying or like the meaning behind what they're saying um so thank you for that i think it's super important as well absolutely and a lot of these terms are still being defined. Like I've been kind of looking into some of my own research and there are things like systemic racism, like that term actually wasn't even really coined until like 1980, right? So it's, it, a lot of these things are actually still developing, which is kind of crazy to me. Any of our students or Anyone want to have any questions or strong reactions to the video? Yeah, go ahead, Kenna. Hi, I'm Kenna. Um, I don't think I introduced myself earlier, but yeah. I'm from Hawaii as well, from Oahu. Um, I think 
a big thing that I always like think about with things like this is like humans have the need to categorize and label. So it's like whether or not it's subconscious and like you're trying to come off that way or you're not trying to come off that way. In our head, we're trying to make sense of everything. And like, I feel like the easiest way is to try and put things in neat categories, but that's not possible all the time. So I don't know, that's just something that just initially I think about. No, that's great. That's a good point. Uh, Kenna, thanks for saying that. I, I think another piece that's important to point out is that human beings, the way that we often make sense of other people's experiences is to uh, compare it to something we've experienced. Uh, that's how we, I can say, oh, I felt something similar when that happened. And, and I think that's an important uh, instinct to be aware of because when we get into conversations about race, ethnicity, uh, social justice, um, it's important to understand where we overlap as human beings, but also to hold space to really listen without automatically associating something in our own minds and our own experience, because really hearing means just, just letting it come in and, and not trying to assign it to a category, which Ken, as you said so nicely, we do, we like to categorize. So I, I, I throw that out there too for this conversation. And I think that's where we also get a lot of dismissal because if you can't relate in any way, because you can't make any of that connection, you're just like, no, I'm not African American. No, I'm not female, whatever it is. You, a lot of people tend to just dismiss things as well. Yeah. And the other thing, go ahead, Doc. I was just going to add that uh, a lot of times people make wrong assumptions, especially when you're a mixed race and they don't understand or don't have the background or experience they make the assumption, why not ask? You know, I, I remember the first time when I met Dr. Davis, I had a colorful beanie on my hat. It was in the winter, you know, kind of deal. And he heard me talk. And the first thing he said, and I took my hat off when I met him, you know, being respectful. And he goes, where are you from? And so we had a, we had a conversation about that. And so I told my, a quick story and he wasn't afraid to ask you know, versus making an assumption, but he knew something was different, but couldn't put a real label to that. But he just was curious, one, just meeting us, and then two, um, just wanted to know where I was from. Ask questions. Yeah, and we have to get something I mean, we talked about a little bit too, is like, I want, want to normalize silence too and like understand like I know we we're kind of trained in our classes and in other zoom especially zoom uh, settings to like not have any like dead air but I think we need to kind of sit with things sometimes and so I totally understand if you're not you know um, and we're not trying to make it super awkward but just want to like make sure we allow people to have that space to have time to process so we won't be too rushing it. And uh, I, I have to like untrain myself to call on people because that's just the teacher in me. But I uh, want to be sure we give people time to process. And there is no pressure. Nobody has to contribute anything. It's totally free to just listen. Um, I was thinking, considering we just watched that video, I was looking at kind of like our PowerPoint that we put together with the questions. And I think the the next good question to kind of bring up um, because of the video is when did I first become aware of race? So take a minute to think about it, right? About, you know, if there's a time that you recall specifically when um, all of a sudden race was like kind of profound for you, the, the differences and um, how old were you? Where were you? What was your impression? How was the encounter? Um, so if we'll take like 60 seconds just Maybe think about that, write it down if you want, um, and feel free to share it.
I actually have a story I can share. I don't think I've shared this story with the Fab Five. <laughs> um, so I grew up in a Catholic school, private Catholic school. I'm like the epitome of, you know, white. I feel like it's terrible. Um, <laughs> My, um, however, my stepdad is Iranian and he's pretty much my dad. I grew up with him. He's, I'm as close to my Iranian stepfather as I am my own dad. Um, but there was this time when I was in third grade at school and we were playing the trust game and I got partnered with um, a girl, Ayana. She was my friend. Um, her family had actually just moved and I'm from Kentucky, Louisville, Kentucky. And her family had just moved to Louisville. Um, from Kenya. They had been living in Kenya. Um, and so we were playing this trust game where you blindfold your partner and you have to do what they say. So I was blindfolded. I had to trust what she was saying to lead me to where, wherever we were going. And unfortunately, <laughs> she uh, ran me right into a brick wall and like knocked me unconscious. And it was a really um, kind of dramatic scene it was silly but um that was probably the first time that race became a thing and i didn't as a, her friend like we were friends i didn't think about it that way until i went home and my parents were like well what consequences did she have to suffer or like go through because she did this you know kind of terrible thing like pushing you down on the playground and um i guess like she got written up right you get like a piece of paper that says you're in trouble um and my parents didn't think that that was sufficient and their argument for her not having a more severe consequence for what happened is they were saying she's the only african-american in this catholic school and so their thought was the principal is trying to protect them and not kind of establish more of a um consequence because they didn't want them to feel uncomfortable if that makes sense so it was a very interesting situation no that was that's a good story it made me think i was reading recently about how like uh, black kids and kids of color they're way more likely to have like discipline and like uh like have those kind of issues of where they're like labeled as you know, aggressive or it's just because of the implicit. And that's another definition that I think uh, we talk about too, is like a lot of this stuff is like subconscious. It's like, we don't even, we don't even know it. We, um, it's just so ingrained in us and we don't, and you, and, and you can take an implicit bias test. It's basically, um, I'll, I'll put the link in the chat, but it, it goes through really fast. So you don't really have time to think and it kind of shows you where, your biases might be that you not don't even think about. And so I think it's super interesting. I'll, uh, I'll show I'll share a story here. Uh, my name is Steve Simmons and I've been on this before. Um, and uh, I'm a soccer coach and assistant AD and, um, and similar to Doug, um, my, I'm a mixed race. My, my mother is, Korean and my father is Caucasian and uh, uh, my father served in the U.S. Air Force for close to 30 years and so I was an Air Force brat. I, I lived on on bases uh, for the most part of my childhood all over the world and so the first time that I experienced that I can remember um, was uh, when we, we lived in England. So we were stationed in England in the, in the 70s. And um, actually, we, we lived off base. And um, my, my brother, who's uh, who at the time, well, he was, he was about four, I was about five, about 13 months apart. We were getting harassed. And um, we, were, uh, we, were, we were being made fun of with like the slant eyes. But we didn't know what they were, what they meant. We 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 had no clue um, what that was about. And then um, I remember my mom came running out, and in her broken English, um, she she started to uh, 
berate the the, the kids that um, who who at the time were they, they were actually British or English uh, well, white kids, and um, and from there on it was um, it was um, kind of this awareness, and and then you know fast forward a couple of years, we my father gets stationed in Charleston, South Carolina, and he's actually from North Carolina. He's actually from the opposite side of the state, uh, Doctor Welch. Um, so I've got a lot of family. That, I've got a lot of family that that is from North Carolina, and um, and so um, now uh, it's it's a, a totally different scenario of um, experiencing racism because at that point in the late seventies, my brother and I didn't fit in either category. We didn't fit into a white category or a black category, and then. Um, uh, I happened to be, uh, or the base I lived on happened to be um, bused to uh, a school closer to downtown Charleston that happened to just get desegregated like eight years earlier. It was one of the last segregated schools in the state of South Carolina. And then all of a sudden, um, the 90% the of the school was African American. And and from 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 this particular school, the the those who were um, uh, Afro American, they were um, of Geechee descent. So they were from the islands. They were from Haiti. Most of them from Haiti. And so I experienced something totally different in that regard, right? And um, so my world has been around pretty good at this time. Well, we moved to Alaska. My father gets stationed to Alaska, so we moved to Alaska. So all this changes, and and then I, I, I experience um, a lot of a lot of that again. Well, as a young adult, my mother and I uh, go to Korea in 2002 for the for the World Cup uh, in soccer, and I had never been there. My mom hadn't been back in 30 something years. We reconnect with her family and cousins that I, I have never met. Well, we end up going to a, a restaurant and bar with my cousins to watch the United States play South Korea in, in Korea. Well, I'm wearing my US soccer jersey and I'm the only person in the bar that has that. Everybody's got their red, red Korean jersey. But I remember when I walked in, People were staring at me for literally 45 minutes. And I asked my cousin, I go, am I doing something wrong here? They go, no, they just don't know who you are. So that's back to Doug's comment. So oddly enough, being a mixed race for the mo most of my childhood, they, they, they kind of thought I was uh, you know, Chinese, right? When I go to the place where my mother's from, where most of the people in America categorize me as Asian looking. They don't think I'm Asian looking enough. They, they're going, where are you from? And so um, the, the, the idea of what, what um, how you identify, and, and, and again, I'll connect back to what Doug was saying. It's easy to jump to conclusions and easy to kind of go with a predetermined thought, maybe what you're used to, maybe what you grew up with, or maybe what society's put there. But um, you know, respectfully ask questions. I think at the end of the day, is is probably the the most respectful, the most inquisitive way um, to kind of live in what Gary Kilgore calls the Church of Reason. You know, to 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 be able to have dialogue. So um, that was that was my journey with that. Very very unique, very interesting. Yeah, I relate so much to a lot of that, Steve. Like growing up on the reservation, it was really interesting. And people would always ask, like, "Well, how's the, you know, how's how's it different?" And like we said, we don't have like we always talk about comparisons. And so like I didn't have anything to compare it to. And but I do remember when I was probably like middle school age, and like there became kind of a real kind of I don't know, just it was like kind of clicky obviously when you get into middle school but like there was this idea and this I think happens a lot in the black community too of like well the darker your skin like the more native you are and the more more and for us it's funny too because we talk about um oh, sorry doggos 
uh, the in, like Indian blood, like how much degree of blood you have. And it's so crazy. It took me until I was probably like 30 to realize like this whole degree of blood thing. I, it's really, no one talks about that. I mean, it's like maybe if you have like dogs, you talk about like breeding and like pedigree, but for Native Americans, it was a way to like, if it was something that was imposed on us to like basically weed us out because if you have someone who's 100 percent Cherokee their kid who maybe you don't have some you know if someone's not full you get with someone who's not full Cherokee then their kid's 50 percent and then down the line right it just comp just will completely erase you know the, the thinking was eventually you're gonna kind of uh just die out and be extinct and so the fact that we within our own community use that against each other is really sad and it really is um heartbreaking and it's like it's really like steve said it's like they're just trying to figure out who you are like and i've learned that it's not about like how how dark your skin is or how much blood you have it's like who knows you and your community and whatever your community that you identify with and um especially with for us in the native community it's like who who in your tribe can speak for you and um, and it's not who you know, but it's who knows you. Kind of, we say that a lot too in, um, in networking. But um, but yeah, I, it's it's just wild though. And you, and like, I still have this thing of like, I like to be more tan. I think it's because it's like, oh, I feel more native when I'm more tan. And it's like, it's just so ingrained in us um, from when we're when we're little. And it's not even, it's so hard to to disconnect. Being that the Native Americans and Polynesians, so many similarities. Yeah. I've dive deep into how I, I shared to talk to Aaron about this a little bit. I shared that with you how the Native Americans came to Polynesia, still really believe that, came more often. But growing up in Hawaii, we're exposed to race right from the get go. You know, I came from a real big family. My mom was one of 14. My mom married a Haole guy, Caucasian guy. I have my aunt married a Samoan guy, another aunt married a, a Filipino guy, one aunt married, married an African American guy, you know. But and I, I got, I got the, I got it on both ends, you know. Being white, I got it from some of my Polynesian cousins, and then uh, being Polynesian, I got it from some of people of different races. But we're exposed to a whole lot of different races being in Hawaii. Hawaii is just a, a different norm in a sense. Um, you know, uh, years ago, I went back to a family reunion and a group of my cousins who I grew up, went to church, played volleyball. Um, uh, they had asked some of the aunts, who's that Howley guy, Caucasian guy, referring to me, who's that guy in our family reunion? They didn't recognize me. I, my hair's gone. My, I'm not as dark as I was. Of course, it was winter time when we went back and then my answer was, oh, that's Douglas. They go, no way, they, they didn't recognize me. You know, so in Hawaii, our culture is a little different. I'm sure Kalai and Nate can, can relate to that too. Yeah, I'll bounce off of that, Coach. Um, in Hawaii, like, you're exposed to it so much, you don't think anything of it. I, I think, for me personally, I didn't really feel the race thing until I went to college because uh, all, of, all of a sudden I became a minority, you know, um, you, in Hawaii, there's, you, know, you don't really think much of it because there's races, all different ethnicities all over the place. So you don't think anything of it. But when I got to the States, you know, all of a sudden you're categorized, you know, everyone's like, oh, the Hawaiian, oh, the Hawaiian, you know, and you're like, oh, I didn't know I stood out. <laughs> you don't even think that you have an accent until you go to the mainland, you know, so um, that was kind of my first experience with that, just because growing up in a way, you don't think anything of it. Can I put Kalai on the spot again? I, uh, I wanted to expand on it because uh, there's something important between the Hawaiian culture and the, the native cultures too, because you, 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 I want to ask the next question is why? You know, why is there a, a need for colorism in, in my opinion, and I think other scholars would agree that this is descended from elitism, and this this elitism is descended from colonialism, right? So, like in the Hawaiian culture in Hawaii today, Kalai is a, a person that gets Hawaiian homes if if he applies for it. So, Kalai is enough Hawaiian that he gets access to resources. And in Hawaii, if 
people are fighting for access to these resources. So race becomes a huge factor. So the more Polynesian, especially the more Hawaiian you are in Hawaii, the more prized you're, you're, you're more sought after um, because, well, partially you get more access to resources, but um, you can see that, Natalie, I mean, Professor Welch and Dr. Welch and your community as well. And I wanted Kalai to talk about that because Kalai has a really prestigious Hawaiian background. Like his family was given land in uh, Eva Beach, but I, I don't want to speak on behalf of Kalai. Thanks, bro. Um, I guess we're going to start with that. I guess, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, Native Hawaiians and Native Americans, very similar, especially when it comes to blood quantum. Um, and in Hawaii, in order to, what he's talking about, to get Hawaiian homes, to get access to these resources, you have to be 50% Hawaiian. Um, and, you know, like every other races, um, especially in Hawaii, because it's such a mixed, you know, mixed culture of people of different ethnicities, the blood quantum starts, starts um, falling off. So less people are, have access to those resources because the blood quantum is diminishing. And um, I guess for Native Hawaiians, you know, it's something that we have to, we had to definitely, you know, be aware of is you need to know that you're, you're gonna eventually, we're gonna lose access to these resources, the less, the less we can, if we keep diminishing our percentage on blood quantum. Um, but that kind of goes back to like Hawaiian history and, and when they made that amendment on how it was kind of the intent was to eventually diminish the blood quantum so that they can eventually be taken over, you know, which is, I guess what we're dealing with in our culture and our society right now with native Hawaiians is to make sure that doesn't happen and to kind of take the responsibility to make sure it doesn't happen. Um, and I guess I can tie that back to my experience at Linfield. Um, I didn't really realize, you know, the responsibility you have, you know, to your own culture. I, re I, re I realized it more when I graduated and after I looked back on my experiences and look back at being categorized and whatnot, like people would say like, oh, the Hawaiians, but they categorize the Hawaiians as a group of people from Hawaii, but not everybody's Hawaiian. Like me, I'm a native Hawaiian. So when you say Hawaiian, you're talking about me as a native Hawaiian, you know, not everybody from Hawaii is Hawaiian. So I guess in lingo, we talked, I mean, everyone spoke on language earlier. That's pretty important because it could be taken the wrong way. You know, definitely you say Hawaiians is, and you make a negative comment about it is like, and you're talking about a group or you're talking about a specific person from Hawaii it's it's it could be taken wrong you know and then it could start this whole thing because because hawaiian is an actual race it's an actual ethnicity you know so it's a, it's a na nationality you know yeah i'm gonna like jump in on that um it's like a very different dynamic not being hawaiian and being from hawaii i'm half white half japanese so like Growing up around the culture, I feel like because you're exposed to that at an earlier age, and it's like you have friends that are Native Hawaiian, you have this understanding of like, when it came to like Linfield, people were like, oh, you're from Hawaii, you must be Hawaiian. I'm like, absolutely not. <laughs> and it's like, there's an erasure there. And it's like, they tried to compare it to, you're from Oregon, Oregonians. And I'm like, that's <laughs> not exactly the same thing. But, um, yeah, it's just being mixed doesn't help as well in that instance, too, because they're like, what are you? And I guess, like, my first experience with, like, acknowledging my race um, wasn't necessarily growing up in school. I would say it would be with standardized testing and having to check mark boxes. And it was like, what race do you identify with the most? And typically, um, it would be people would say, oh, you're my dad's local Japanese. And they're like, oh, you put down Asian. And I'm like, mm, no, my mom's white. I'm white and Japanese. And it's like, you can only pick one. And so I'd always default to putting other because I just didn't feel comfortable enough not picking one over the other because that wasn't who I am. And I had that same experience um, at Linfield. I think it was like a survey or something. 
it was anonymous, but I was still like, you can only pick one. And that didn't sit right with me because um, my mom and my dad had tried so hard to like raise me and my older sister to be proud of both sides. And so like, um, and it, it's also too, it's a different dynamic with my mom not being from Hawaii. She, but she's lived in Hawaii longer than she lived in Idaho. So she calls Hawaii her home versus like anywhere else because she just, it, it's, it's a lot of <laughs> back and forth, but um, it's definitely something I've had to think about more now, but definitely wasn't like anything detrimental to me when I was younger. It didn't, I wasn't um, discriminated against because of what I looked like or what my ethnicity was because everyone's mixed, so yeah. <laughs> I think I, I'm glad you mentioned the erasure. I think that's what so much of this is. It's like, you know, they talk about a melting pot of the United States and it's like, well, it's not really, I don't think of it as a melting pot, more of it as like kind of just like a mixed stew of different backgrounds or like you said, like I, I have I have a lot of trouble with the surveys and it's like when they have like multiracial or because uh, it's like, well, how are they, they're like, what we call it too, is there's, um, in Native community say the asterisk, so like, there's all, whenever you see research and stuff, it'll have like an asterisk for like the other, and like, it's again, the othering and like the erasure is just really, really weird, and I always, it's funny, I always like, I always check Native American, even though I'm not full blood Cherokee, but that's how I identify, and um there's a pizza place here nearby that <laughs> I like if you do the survey you get like five dollars off your next order so like I do the survey every time and every time I put Native American and I'm like this has got to be skewing their data so much because I eat there so much that I know that they're like there's not that many Native Americans here but it's 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 just it's really fascinating and it's I mean and it's it's everywhere it's census it's school surveys it's you know every year you know now we're being tracked in every way possible and so um and it's for a lot of times i think it's kind of you know like marketing it's it's used to generalize and you know people try to do you know uh you know uh hispanic awareness nights or latina latinx nights or native american heritage nights and it it's really it gets really tricky and it gets really I think it's so complicated when you think about like the capitalism intersecting with all of it like for the standardized testing SAT tests mm. stuff like that like um it's not it doesn't determine academic potential you know your race so why other than collecting data you know like scientific purposes I don't know what scientific reasoning they would be using that for exactly but other than that like why don't we get rid of that in standardized testing like for academics well and i'll add too like that uh, that's like when you look at there certainly we had a conversation about this a little bit last week about um the need for in some ways tracking ethnicity to make sure that we are being intentionally equitable right mm -hmm. but um but when you think about um categorizing having to categorize yourself on that and in getting to your point natalie of, of othering right if you you either fit in one of these boxes or you're other a horrible <laughs> use of that word right which is basically just reinforcing that this is the standard this is other and when you and when that bleeds into other areas right so you've got like i can i can think Directly, I know several people on this call can talk about the uh, the image policy for football players and and how you know to set a standard of this and everything else is other and therefore doesn't fit with the image that we want. How damaging that is, and how um, you know can I use the word erasure? Like it, it's that is erasing your culture. That is erasing your heritage. It's erasing who you are. Um, and I wonder if any of the football players want to talk about that on this call. <laughs> Creating that fit is somewhat the institutional racism, right? And 
Yeah, I didn't want to st- steal the way. I'm definitely going to get the football players to contribute if they like. I just wanted to bring up the NCAA and how they do their diversity research because it blows my mind that they, how they categorize, how they have American Indian, Alaska Native, way different, Asian, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, all together in one group. And then the two are more racist and then the non-resident alien. Like, it blows my mind that they still use this terminology. Like... Like who, I, oh gosh, yeah, it's very, very problematic in my, my opinion, but um, it's, you know, one of the biggest organizations in, in, in the world. And, um, and I can't imagine being a student and like a freshman and going in and being like, well, you know, what do I, what do, I do here? <laughs> As a, as a coach, as, a, uh, as part of that institution, Natalie, um, yeah, right. why why do we really give a damn um, what where some who where someone descended from? We're we're here to engage with each student athlete as just what they are. They're uh, they're a person um, that brings what they bring to the table, and uh, we want that we want to give each one the best experience we can. And it really doesn't matter um their their background the color of their skin their 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 heritage or whatnot we're here to present them with a an athletic opportunity and we welcome um them for you know who they are well i i dissent i uh it's not it's not the skin color that matters it's how you treat the skin color correct so their skin color is part of their story and like when you're dealing with trauma like jane is dealing with or students from marginalized backgrounds like you have to take into account their skin color and you may need to treat them differently that's that's equity and it goes back to i I think also i I appreciate what you're saying mike um it's also who sets the table whose table is it right (laughs) like and at linfield it's a it's a it's a white table it's a white table that um has historically been um inviting others right and so and and that's uh that's the heritage of the school but how does the table become how does the table become broader how is the table set set up by everyone in the community i think that's something that's important for us as a school to look at that that not everybody on this call is is um linfield associated but that is something that um this is part of our motivation in these cat chats. And, like, and it's not just Linfield. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not, right? It's, it's each of our communities. This is this is what we're doing at Linfield though. <laughs> but it's it but it's it is predominantly white most places. It's a, and it's interesting too, I think, with the sports angle because I and I think we've all kind of had stories of sports stuff and it, it I I have like kind of a devil's advocate in me all the time with sports because I've just seen so much research about how, you know, the the African or black males are profited off of in, you know, in basketball and football, and yet they never are given the opportunities to be coaches or take leadership roles. And, um, and then you look at the coaches and they're all white males, or um, it's really, really, I think, really complicated and I go back and forth because I do think like Mike you said like we shouldn't have to like have to consider I think but at the same time I think for like the NCAA I think it's it's good to have the data just so we can see where okay where are we where are we missing like where 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 can we do better I think that's I think the kind of argument for collecting data is like well how can we you know if we're obviously underserving a, a, a population, um, how can we provide, what are the barriers for them getting here and how can we better provide an opportunity? And um, that's, a, I, I know a huge thing for a lot of, um, and then you think about the socioeconomic background um, is, is also another really interesting dynamic and in how all that plays in. I could add, <clears throat> That's the going to be the challenge of our, our coaching staff, and that's something that I'm going to take responsibility for and to help our coaches 
um, we're recruiting kids of color to our programs. If they're great athletes, they're gonna help your program. Well, there's more to it than just that. One, we gotta make them, we gotta make our kids, all of our kids, especially kids of color, you gotta understand their backgrounds and the things they've struggled with when they're on your campus and help meet their needs, because it's different, whether you like it or not. And to give them the resources or the help or whatever they need to, to stay at Linfield, where it's mostly a white community. And so we gotta find the needs, we gotta understand their needs, and then we gotta find ways to meet their needs. Because that's real important, because if you get a great athlete of color that's here and you don't meet their needs, we're going to lose them. And so that's real critical for all our coaches to know more than just coaching great athletes is to understand the needs of kids of color and appreciate what they're going through, their struggles, <coughs> and even language, using the appropriate language. Some of our coaches are saying things that are offensive and they might not even know it because they don't appreciate and don't understand it. And that needs to stop. I think um, I we we've, we've talked a lot about like critical thinking and kind of the steps towards critical thinking um, and like part of that is just like asking questions like why um, and so when I think about you know for me I'm like well you know of course we should you know try to make people feel included and comfortable and like what can we do to better support um, like these minority groups on campus but for me I think about also like why don't these coaches already think that you know why why do we have to teach them why aren't they already thinking about how to make it better for their teammates um and i know john has talked about this a little bit too but i think a lot of it comes from our history that we easily forget about and i think it's important to remember that these older people in power, older white men, you know, that are 60 plus years old, Jim Crow laws, redlining, that was only 55 years ago. And I think that we forget about, um, you know, like obviously not in my young 30 years that I ever experienced that, but a lot of our older white people, males, men in power were a part of that, grew up in it. Their parents were a part of it, their grandparents. So that's like so ingrained in them and they have to really work hard to unlearn that. And I think that's where we, it's on, a, on us to like help with that. But I think it's important to remember why they're thinking that way, you know, so that you can understand how to help teach them a different way. Coach Willis. <laughs> I've just been listening. This has been uh, this has been great. Um, my perspective is a lot different coming from the South. Um, you know, where I'm from, I mean, I've been told that it's better to like duck your head and not even make eye contact with somebody because they're white or because you're black. Um, I remember having to have conversations with um, when I was a high school coach I remember having to have conversations uh with kids saying hey you know this girl's grandmother she's not gonna understand you dating her because you're black and she's white you know um those those, those things are are real um there's been so much said today but but I I want everybody to understand that this system that we live in in America it is solely constructed on race and on the fact that white is the superior race. If you, if you can't see that, then you, you're fooling yourself. So like for it to come full circle, something like standardized testing, which there are some names that are even too long to fit on the blocks in, in itself. Like, okay, so if you look at schools, I taught at a school one time and we had something called the FCAT. That was a standardized test in, the, uh, in Florida. That was a result of the No Child Left Behind Act. Well, the kids took the test in the 10th grade. In that school, you took Algebra 1A in 9th grade and Algebra 1B in the 10th grade. So if, I, if you're telling me by the time I'm supposed to take the SAE, if I haven't even seen like geometry, 
there's no way I'm going to score high on the math portion of that test because I'm not even, I'm not even offered those courses. So of course I'm not going to make the score that allows me to get into your Ivy League school because you only want to hire graduates from certain schools anyway. You see what I'm saying? So, so that, is the, that is the systemic part that is there in education. It's there in housing where you're not allowed to buy houses in certain neighborhoods. So like, because I can't buy a house and it's not how much money I make, it's the fact that I can't buy a house in a certain neighborhood. So therefore my child can't go to said school where things are even offered like AP classes. Like look at the, look at the, the resources. Like I was bused 30 minutes across town to go to high school because of the resources that the school offered and I tested high enough to get into the school. And that's ridiculous. When, when you look at, when you look at, there's a school called Revolt High School, which is five minutes from my mother's house. In, in 2000, Revolt High School had 11 guys on active NFL rosters. Like that is insane how many, you know, the talent that has come out of that school. Well, okay. You're talking one computer lab in the whole high school that might have like 15 computers. Well, when I went to high school, there were four computers in every classroom. You know, so, so when you're talking about making everybody take the exact same test, when everybody's resources are not the same, obviously certain people are going to or fail. Like I coach basketball. Jane, if every time your team shot the ball, it was worth one point, And every time my team shot the ball, it was worth five points. I'm probably going to beat you. Right. So, so again, um, oftentimes I say to people, especially white people, I call this like operating in whiteness. Um, I'm going to coin the, the phrase like we saw with uh, Ted, is his last name, Yoho, the, 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 uh, the representative who, who called AOC out of name on the, on the steps last week. Did you guys hear about that? Don't and get how me he, started. Do not get me started. And, but, oh, okay, I will but, mute myself now. But his, his apology, his apology was completely dismissive. Like, that is whiteness at its finest. You can do or say whatever you want and not be held accountable for it and not even have to apologize for it. Like, that is, the, that is operating in whiteness 101, right? And it's, it's, it's insane. But to, sh to show, like you guys were talking about football earlier, um, in the South, you know, it's all about speed, right? And you get all these black guys at these skill positions, right? And then you get these Hawaiian guys at these interior positions, right? Because they're supposedly stronger, right? But then the smart people are the white people who play quarterback. Like, that's insane to me. That makes, that makes no sense to me at all. I love this group, but I think we have to understand that where we live, okay, like where we live, it's solely based on race. It's solely based on race. And that's, I, I think that's hard. It's, it's got to be hard for white people to, to understand what it's like to not be white in this country. You know, just, just understanding what is, what is to not be white in this country. And, you know, the fact that as a black person, Okay, you want me to celebrate the 4th of July as an Independence Day? Well, it took another 89 years that I was still in bondage. You know, from a, from a, from a sporting perspective, it, it makes no sense to me. I'm like, why do black guys even go play in the NCAA? For what? It makes no sense. Because continually, Schools make millions and millions of dollars off of the backs of athletes. You know, like 70,000 people can go crazy as you run and score a touchdown. Yes, but like, are they going to hire you? Are they all right with you marrying their daughter? That's legit. That's a legitimate question. <laughs> that is all for now. You're awesome, John. Yes, I want to comment about the, the sexist. I mean, if you haven't really watched the, her response again, she really um, 
gave a good response. It was painful to hear, even her saying that, you know, it's been normalized. And so, anyway, I, I just, I was just, leave it is not a, a good way to express my emotions or, or all that, but we need to change. And we need to change beginning with us. And so we need to be the voice that then will bring this change. Um, I, I, I kind of uh, I blacked out there and I'm back on uh, and I missed some of this engaging dialogue. I, I want to address what uh, Coach Blackmore, Mike, you were talking about earlier about as coaches, how we, you know, we don't care where they're from and whatnot, because for years that, that's kind of the, the, um, the, the philosophy that I, that I took and um, and I, just recently, uh, like Coach Hire, <coughs> through my children, who um, are are um, who I bounce bounce things off of, um, I, I think um, it's important that we we do know, and we do care where they're from, and we do care how they look, so that we can make our environments, uh, as far as the sporting world, the student athlete centered. It's a student athlete centered environment with, with standards that each of our sports have. We have standards, we have requirements, we have a code of conduct, et cetera, et cetera. But I've learned that it's important that um, we make that a student athlete centered environment. We kind of already do it with academics. We've been doing that. So at the division three level, we are very aware that uh, if there's a conflict with class, that the class comes first, right? So, so we, we, we help them mitigate that. But uh, also understanding um, their backgrounds, their, their, you know, the, 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 the impact of their skin color, their gender, because society is in that same boat and we can meet these student athletes, students where they're at and address their needs and still deliver that, that wonderful experience in the competitive realm, that's where I've evolved, you know, in the last three, four years. Because as, as a, an athlete, it's like, hey, get the job done. I don't care where you're from, make smart decisions, get good grades and work, get, your, get the job done. Which I think those are all true. Those are all hallmarks, but I think we have to be inclusive of the other piece because we do need to meet the student athletes where they're at. So I just I want to expand on that. Yeah. Well, that, that's, that was my mindset for a yeah. long time. I'm, I'm, I'm not being, when I said that, I'm not being dismissive of where somebody's from um, because, you know, we're all from somewhere and we all have experiences that um, each of us, um, I don't want to say this, um, how, how we perceive things. You know, I'm, I'm from a small white farming town, so I've been expected to perceive things in a, in a different way or the same way that my, my family, you know, my, my parents and my grandparents do. And I don't, you know, um, there's some things I could say about my family that um, I'm embarrassed about um, the way that they see the color, the color of other people's skins. And, and uh, you know, it bothers me a lot. So, um, you know, Aaron, I, I, I know why you descended on my comments. And I didn't mean it in such a way that, um, that um, you know, you know, everybody should feel welcome on, on campus for who they are and not because uh, they're an athlete or they're a student. They, they need to, we need to, yeah, like, like Steve said, we need to understand where they're from and what they bring to the table and we don't ignore that. So that's, that's how I, that's kind of what I meant to say, not that we ignore who they yeah, are and what they sure. are. Um, they're not, they didn't come to school to win games. Um, they came here for the experience that, uh, that we hope we offer at Linfield and we hope they leave, they leave us, um, and, and come back and because they had a great experience here and, and, uh, we gave them what they wanted. Totally. Uh, I think this also kind of ties back to what we were kind of saying at the beginning of this talk too around language and like how you're saying things and sometimes what you're saying isn't it might not be what was perceived by the other person or like intent not what your intent was and like I even myself struggle sometimes to articulate these difficult conversations and discussions just because 
unfortunately, my white privilege, I haven't had to be forced to have these conversations and haven't had the practice to um, really articulate those things. And I think like when I, Mike, when you first said it and I was like, well, in my mind, I was like, what you mean is I don't care where you come from. I'm going to love you. I'm going to respect you. I'm going to bring you in regardless of where you come from. And, but then like on the flip side too, it's like now that conversation too, as a coach needs to be like, of course, I'm going to love you and respect you and bring you in and make you one of my own. And, you know, as part of this team, but I also want to know where you're from because, and, you know, and like make that, that needs to be a part of our culture all the time too on our teams is well, having that and, understanding. And, and Lindsay, and, the, and for me, the reason why that's important, because if I have a person that uh, experiences their journey differently, um, that, I have to acknowledge that. Yeah. You know, I have to acknowledge that. I, I went to, like I said earlier, I went to uh, uh, a 90% inner city school in South Carolina um, and had the majority of my friends who were, who were uh, black, African-American, Geechee, but I don't know what it feels like to be them, even yeah. though I was, I, cause I'm not, I don't know that. So I think that, 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 that piece is, is absolutely critical yeah. that, that we do that and, and, and um, meet again, meet the student athletes where they're at. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, if this is a student athlete centered environment, I think we're trying to promote in the athletic pro, uh, department and I think university wide with students, um, and everything you said, Mike, is exactly it. I, of course we are. We're going to love them. We're going to teach them. We're going to to do our best to give them the best experience. But that, that comes with acknowledging. Because I know so many people after the fact that struggled and I never knew. I never, I, I never knew. And until years later, we have a conversation. And I'm thinking to myself, well, shoot, man. If, you know, if I'd have known that, I, I would have done this, this, and this. And so... That's where kind of my perspective comes from. Well, Steve, you can also share about, Steve asked me uh, recruiting Hawaii. Yeah. Steve, you want to share a little bit about that quick story? Uh, about, about the... Um... Parent, what should I tell the parent? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, Doug, were you, was it in February, right? You were back over there? Well, was, when you came back, you had to, you wanted to touch base with the gal from Hawaii and you asked what should I tell the mom I mean what what information you're you want to know what's important yes and I shared with you well if you're recruiting in Hawaii you, you better talk to the mom because she's gonna have these questions about things about their kids that's right that's right no that's exactly it and uh boy you know was was coach hire right and um you know, and, and I was able to to really spend time and 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 establish a relationship and um, uh, get to know the the mother well and um, and you know and and because of of coach um, you know that that young lady who's a salutatorian Kamehameha Maui she's coming to Linfield and um, you know I can I guarantee you I I don't know I I wouldn't have known it to that degree. Um, but um, that again is trying to um, meet meet the, the the prospective student and their family where they're at. So yeah, that's a that was a great example. I I have said so many th good things in there, but I do think Mike, the fact that you you're here and you show up and you have com have these conversations and like we have to be willing to do that and have to say, well, you know, I didn't mean. I, that's not what I meant. And like, that's, that's, it's like, yeah, we can totally understand that. And like, I think the bigger problem is the people who aren't here today. Right. And like the people that often we go to the, I go to diversity things all the time. And it's like, you know, you're kind of preaching to the choir at a certain point. Uh, and it is, it's really hard. And I tell people all the time, I'm like, it would be so much easier. My grad program that I went to was 30 people and from all over Taiwan, India, um, there's only five white males. And so everyone else was either a woman, a, someone of a person of color. And we, we talked about race constantly and we joked and we joked about it. And we just like, we, we kind of lived in that. And like, in, and we had times when we said, well, you know, well that didn't feel good when you said that. And 
but we talked about it. And I think that's the big, big problem in, in, in America is that we just don't want to, we just don't want to talk about it. And, you know, even admit, say, well, you know, for me, for example, I, there's been times where I've been on a campus or somewhere and I've seen a person of color, usually, a, you know, a male, and, it, and you have that thought of like, oh, you kind of just maybe go walk the other crosswalk or walk the other sidewalk. And it's like those implicit things. And it's like, and then you have like, the, but then you realize like, why did I do that? Like, why would I have been that if he was white? And, and it's really, it's hard to admit that. Like, I'm, I'm ashamed of it. And it, but you know, it makes me think, well, now next time I see, I walk and I see, see a, a black guy, I'm going to go smile at him and wave and why do I go by, you know, like, and try to, or, you know, not try to engage. And like John said, not, hopefully he won't have his head down, you know, and um, it's, it's really, it's hard. These conversations are really hard, but the fact that we can just be willing to have them and um, learn from each other because experience is everything. Now, I think um, what you're talking about right now, I think that really speaks to the, to the importance of imagery. And um, like I was saying to someone earlier um, via Facebook, um, like why am I as a black male, why am I portrayed um, as violent and as dangerous? And, and um, you know, or if I was Native American, like why am I portrayed as savage? Like right, why why are why are these um, adjectives used to describe me? Why why in cartoons? Why are villains always associated with color, or some sort of deformity, or some sort of accent? Right, we we don't have we don't we don't usually get a a, a villain with like a straight jawbone and perfect white teeth and blonde hair and blue eyes. That's usually not the villain that we get in cartoons. So I'm saying. And I'm asking that because, okay, if you look at like who's shooting up schools, right? Like who who is who is who has enslaved a group of people? Who who has who has created a system that specifically oppresses and keeps people down? Like th those are white men. Like there's only one group represented in this country who have never had a law created to give them permission to do anything. And those are white men. If we look at who is shooting up schools, we're looking at mass shootings. We, if we look up who has, who has committed the most violent acts in this country, it's not people who look like me. It's not. So like, so that is where, that is where the importance of, of imagery comes in and of and of media and and this is something I had to tell my wife and my wife is white um and you know I had to tell her I'm like the way we get information the way that the media um you know presents information to us number one we don't have the opportunity to digest right because stuff is just coming at us so fast and it's it's like it's not even important to be accurate it's just important to be first, right? To just get a story out there. And, you know, and, and there's lighting and there are things that are done, you know, like, like people are like, like I had to call somebody out, man, who lives in South Carolina. They're like, well, Portland is a war zone. Uh, there needs to be like federal troops there. And I'm like, have you even been to Portland? Right? And I'm like, I've been in, I've been in five protests personally and none of them have been violent at all. And if, and if we're going to define violence, then who, who, who sets the definition for violence? Is it, is it driving a car through a group of people in Charlottesville? Because that sounds pretty violent to me. You know, is it, I, I, I'm just saying that it's, it's uh, it, the hypocrisy is outrageous. It's crazy. You know, and, and I told someone, I, I go, I said, well, maybe, maybe you will get it if roles were reversed, like if roles were reversed. So like when people are like, oh, well, you know, this person killed this cop, you know, these blue lives matter. Well, the thing is, if I go kill a cop, I'm probably going to jail, right? Because that's how the justice system works. 
but yet Breonna Taylor's killers haven't been arrested. That's what I'm, that's what, that's what I'm at with it. Um, you know, that's that. And again, let me make that very clear. I have no desire to go kill any cops. I don't, I have not vandalized anything because that's not what I believe in personally. However, people are upset because there is a lack of accountability. There is a lack of justice. Like we live in America where a guy named Ahmaud Aubrey can go running for whatever reason, can run through a neighborhood. People can be parked in a car with guns drawn and shoot him three times. And the district attorney can say, do not go arrest them for two months. That's where we live. You know, we live in a country where a lady can be sleeping in bed next to her husband. And the police can knock down the door and she could get shot eight times. And those officers are not arrested. We live in a country where a gentleman can get pulled over and tell the police, sir, I have a concealed firearm. I have a weapon in my car. And the police in their bulletproof vest with all of their tactical gear can shoot him five times in front of his girlfriend and his three-year-old daughter. And then on top of that, he doesn't get accused of murder and he's gonna get paid $40,000 a year for his mental damages by taxpaying dollars. And that's, that's, that's what I don't understand. Like when people say black lives matter, like why is your response all lives matter? Only when somebody says black lives matter. Because when people say blue lives matter, you don't say all lives matter. Or when people say back the blue, do you say, what about the teachers? Or what about the, what about the, what about the garbage men? What about the sanitation engineers? What, what about the doctors? Do you say doctors? When people say blue lives matter, do you say nurses lives matter? Do you say that? Because if you don't, then that's hypocritical. I mean, anybody can answer the, I know I'm like the only, I'm not gonna say I'm the only, I know I'm a black person on the call. So I know there are white people on the call and, and, and please believe uh, I am passionate about it because it's my life, right? Like there's not another me on the shelf at Walmart. Yeah. So, so, I mean, for me to get pulled over by the police, for me to get a ticket is like a victory because getting a ticket is the last thing on my mind. I get pulled over by the cops. The only thing I am thinking about is, am I going to make it home to my family? I used to drive a Chevy Impala, okay? It was a silver Chevy Impala with tinted windows. And where I'm from, okay, you drive those, right? Like, it's a status thing. When I got to Oregon, I think I had that car like four months. And I was like, I have to get out of this car because I get pulled over way too much in this car. I drive the same roads, but now I have a pickup truck. I have a white pickup truck with some big tires on it. And I haven't been pulled over yet. So. <laughs> that is so insane. Oh, no. Oh, and, and I don't know, I don't, I don't know how to tell you that this is the reality of the, of my American experience. And I think that's why you have to see color. I think that's why you have to see color because if a, if a female, if any student, not even just a female, it could be a male. If any student comes to me and says, coach, I was raped. My response cannot be, well, what did you wear? Right? Like, that can't, that can't be my response. My response can't be, well, well, what did you wear? Or, or you were asking for it. Right? Like, that's insane. That is insane, right? You can't, you can't do that. And so I, I believe that, you know, like, I don't know because I wasn't a part of the football program. But I, I was hearing that there were like guidelines that people had to, to wear or look like. And I'm like, well, what if my culture is to have longer hair? You're stripping me of my identity because it doesn't look like you. So to me, this whole idea of a melting pot is a big pile of crap. 
Because if you're going to say we're all this big melting pot and that we're all created equal, then why does only your opinion matter? That's what I don't, that's what I don't, that's what I don't understand. Like, I, I, I don't get that. I don't get that. It's just like when people are like, well, why are they tearing down monuments? Why are they tearing down statues? Do you, do you understand, like, when the statues were built? Do you understand that the statues go up in response to the Civil Rights to the Civil Rights uh, Act? Like, do you understand what that is? Do you, can you imagine being, can you imagine being of Native American descent and you have to get a statue of Andrew Jackson? Right? But like, are you expecting a Hitler statue to be erected in a Jewish community? Like, okay. Can, can we put a Bin Laden statue at Ground Zero in New York? You know, and, and, and what's so ironic was so, was, was, it's not ironic. It's hypocritical. I'm going to stop saying it's ironic. I'm going to call it what it is. It's hypocritical. For people to say that and, and to just be anti-Muslim uh, because of a few people who decided to hijack some planes and attack America, you just denounce the entire religion, but yet you want me to say it's a few bad cops? That's crazy. No, Steve. Yeah, um, just to, first of all, Coach Willis, man, that's, that's pretty powerful, and I, and I know, I know, I appreciate that. And I, I was, you just triggered something, um, a, a memory of mine. Um, I had a young man when I coached at Oregon State, um, who uh, who had a a, a, um, um, a black father and a white mother, and um, and I remember uh, toward his senior year at Oregon State, just before he got drafted into Major League Soccer, we were just talking about something. And he goes, yeah, my dad, my dad took me and my brother and uh, showed us how, how, you know, how to drive and what to do if we got pulled over by the cops. I go, what? He goes, yeah. He said, don't ever wear a hoodie, number one. And make sure your hands are 10 and 2. Make sure you're looking straight. Make sure you say yes sir and no sir. And you don't make any quick movements. And I, I remember that because it dawned on me that, oh my goodness, like your, your life, your life is um, completely different in that way. Because I had never had to do that with my children. I never had it been done to me. And so when you brought up your silver impala um, example, it just triggered that 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 uh, memory of um, one of my former student athletes telling me how his father did it to make sure that um, that the kids wouldn't get shot. Yeah, it's a profound. Uh, reality that we live in. And I, I really, I appreciate uh, John. Freaking love you, man. <laughs> I love you and I'd love you for, for spelling it out as plainly as you do, because as you said, you know, you're, you're one black man on a call with several white people and we need to hear this. And, and um, thank you. Thank you for always, always putting it out there for us. Um, we, are past 1.30, which is normally our the end of this, um, but I do want to, we, we want to make sure that everybody gets a chance to chime in before we end this. I also want to remind everybody that we do this every Friday, every Friday at noon, and that link is the same every time, so you're welcome anytime, every time. Um, but before we wrap up today, is there anything anyone else wants to share, wants to add, wants to put out there for us? I just want to tell people um, that whole like angry black man thing is really a myth. Um, like it's not about revenge, right? Like I don't want to be treated special. It's about equality, right? It's, it's about, okay, I pay taxes. I don't have a problem paying taxes. 
I don't have a problem being a law-abiding citizen. Um, however, we need the same justice. Like we just need the same energy. Like that's 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 it. Like, we just need the same energy. Um, and um, I am I'm wide open if somebody would like to talk or discuss or have any conversation. Um, and I and I like to learn too. You know, I like to learn as well. So um, I just want to make sure that I put that out there. I do get passionate when I talk, but I'm really not angry. Really not. John, I'm going to have you come speak to my week on Thursday, the 22nd, the 22nd of August. Thursday, 22nd of August. Yeah. The, one of the, in, I'm, I'm leading the conversations on social justice today, orientation the whole week. So that Thursday, the 22nd, is dedicated to Black Lives Matter movement and everything. And so I'll be reaching out to you. Just get ready. I have, so I think that might be a platform that we're really going to engage that week. I'm very excited about that. Okay. I am ready. I will be right there. You just let me know what time. Yes, I will. I will say that uh, John came and spoke, gave us a pregame speech before two of our games that we both won and the program had never beaten this team before ever. And we won both games thanks to his pregame speech. So he is very motivational. <laughs> there we go. We're going to get the new students understanding these concepts early enough so they can engage fully. That's, that's the way to go right now is we're going to start with us. That's right. That's, that's my new mission. Like, yes. I start with me and then I push, but I gotta, I gotta start with me. That's right, I love it. Yes. Awesome, I wanna thank everyone, all of our guests too for sticking with us. Um, it's a, 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 probably a big chunk of your days and I, we appreciate it. And I mean, we could go on like this all afternoon, I know, but, um, but like Jane said, we're here every Friday. Um, I wanna add one tidbit, because I think John mentioned something about um, Hitler or the Holocaust and, uh, most people don't know, but Hitler actually based his idea about genocide of Jewish people. He modeled it after the genocide of Native American people in the United States, in what would be the United States. So, um, and people just have such a hard time admitting what happened to uh, people on this land was genocide, and uh, it's it's just wild to think about. So, again, history and that stuff super important and. I just am so thankful for this space and for everyone for um, coming and bringing, bringing open minds and being okay with just, you know, speaking and sharing experiences. I don't want to put Nate on the spot, but I was, I know Nate's generally pretty quiet, but maybe Nate, we can get you next time. But I'd like to hear more from, maybe get some more of our alumni on board and kind of show the story a little bit, you know, about uh, their experiences here at Linfield. Yeah, no, I don't know. I'm happy to jump on. The, the conversation kind of went uh, left in what I was going to go on. So um, I just, you know, stay put. But uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy to join. That would be awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. That was, that was something that Travis and I also talked about. Travis McGuire, who's our social media coordinator at Linfield, was getting more alumni and especially um, alumni of color to come and speak about and like I think Steve said is or you know they don't you don't they don't really process what's happening until they leave and um, sometimes so having them come back I think and talk about their experience would be really really insightful so stay tuned appreciate you guys coming on Kalai is great seeing you man yeah. you too. Good see all of you. Thank you everybody thank you so much Appreciate all of you. Stay safe. Okay. Right. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye. Bento time. Bento time. <laughs> <laughs>